to begin, we are going to start at this question of the relationship between Judaism and science from a historical perspective uh, to this man here on my left, Professor Noah Efron, who is a senior faculty member at the Graduate Program in Science, Technology, and Society at Bar Ilan University in Israel. So he wins the prize for farthest travel. <laughs> He's also a member of the Executive Committee of the International Society for Science and Religion. He's been appointed to serve on the Israeli Ministry of Agriculture's committee to evaluate and regulate genetically modified agriculture and invited to participate in Knesset deliberations on human cloning. His Judaism and Science, a historical introduction, was published by Greenwood Press at the start of 2007, and he was awarded a Philadelphia Center for Science and Religion book grant, with the support of which, are you still presently writing it, or is it still, still presently? <laughs> Uh, writing the book Playing God, hum Human and Divine in the Age of Biotechnology, which will be published by Harvard University Press. Professor Efron's essays on the politics of religion and the politics of science have appeared in the Jerusalem Report, Midstream, Tikkun, Jewish Action, Hadassah Magazine, World Jewish Digest, and the book Boston Book Review, for which he was a contributing writer. He lives in Tel Aviv with his wife, daughter, son, mutt, and bunny. So please join with me in welcoming Noah Efron. Thank you. Um, we now have a cat as well. Her, her name is Louisa May Allcat. And, um, uh, and, um, uh, and then uh, last year, I, I, I published a book called The Chosen Calling, Jews um, and Science in the 20th Century, which if you buy on Amazon, I get a dollar. Every time, so you should do that. Um, Jeff, thank you so much. It is such um, an honor, and really, I, I'm so happy to be here in this room, which in in many ways seems to me to be like the one small step towards the world to come. It's really lovely to see so many people interested in this topic that's so important in such interesting ways um, from the proposals that I I read. Um, so um, I'll begin like this: an American kid. Uh, celebrating his bar mitzvah any time from 1935 to 1960, was bound to receive um, among the kiddish cups and the prayer books and the watches and the fountain pens an oversized volume called From Moses to Einstein, They Are All Jews by a man named Mac Davis. Um, my father's copy sits on my shelf. The book never went out of print in those 25 years. It begins with biographies of Moses and of Bar Kokhba and of Maimonides, but quickly enough, it turns to such modern heroes as Abraham Schreiner, the Galicia Jew who first synthesized petroleum, and then to Sigmund Marcus, the Viennese Jew who engineered the first horseless wagon, then Otto Lilienthal, the German Jew who designed the first manned aircraft, Albert Michelson, the Chicago Jew, who calculated the speed of light and who harvested a Nobel Prize. Then Paul Ehrlich and August uh, von Fassermann, who discovered a cure for syphilis, an achievement for which they also won Nobel Prizes. Then Karl Landsteiner, who devised blood typing, again winning a Nobel Prize. On and on and on through Nobel, Nobel laureates until Albert Einstein himself. So from Moses to Einstein is a charming expression of Jewish pride in the middle of the, for Jews, tumultuous and fearsome 20th century. Um, and it's also a polemic, arguing that the brilliant distinction of Jewish scientists in the 20th century was the product, in fact, of a tradition of scientific excellence of Jews stretching back thousands of years. That idea is everywhere. When the great physicist died, Israel's education minister, Ben Sion Dinor, wrote of him, quote, Albert Einstein exemplified the ideal man of wisdom as conceived by the Jewish sages through the ages. But matters are more complicated than this applies. There is no Jewish tradition of scientific excellence. There has never been a unified Jewish attitude towards nature at all, and how, and whether, and when it should be studied. Throughout history, an almost anarchic pluralism has reigned among Jews when it comes to science. Some saw religious value in it, others didn't. Often Jews were apathetic about science. There were rare times when Jews opposed this or that theory or finding of science, and there were times when Jews embraced this theory or that with enthusiasm as somehow as confirmation of the Torah or of the rabbis. This babble of attitudes really isn't surprising. When you think about it, diversity like this is exactly what you'd expect from a people who lived spread around the globe in contact with countless cultures over three long millennia. So I, I was asked to speak about the history of Judaism and science. So it's with some embarrassment that I find myself saying at the very start, there is no 
history of Judaism and science, there are complicated multiplicities of histories of Judaisms and sciences in different times and places. Still, when you look at the long sweep of Jewish engagements with science, some patterns do recur. One pattern is that religious engagement, what some people call theological engagement, with the questions that science raises is in fact rarer historically among Jews than among Christians and among Muslims. There were some religious or theological engagements. Some Jews in different places and times argued that understanding the, girl, the world that God made does in fact allow us to understand God and his Torah. On rare occasions, others concluded that this or that scientific theory challenged the validity of Torah and therefore we need to reject it. This was rare though, in part because early on, Jews developed an exegetical strategy, a tradition of interpretation that always saw interpretations as superior to literal readings of the text, always. Thus, when science produced knowledge that seemed to conflict with scripture, it was always possible, and it was even traditional, to reinterpret scripture. Overall, this had the effect of diminishing the danger of scientific knowledge to Jewish knowledge. It diminished the danger by diminishing the degree to which, strictly speaking, science was relevant to Judaism at all, and vice versa. Often, this had the further effect of diminishing the importance that science held for Jews. So Rabbi Judah Lo Ben Betzalel, the great Maharal of Prague, wrote at the very start of the 17th century that what we call science has practical value, he wrote, just like the knowledge of a shoemaker has practical value. The statements of the scientists may be true, Maharal argued, but they really don't matter in a way that the statements of the rabbis matter. They matter in a certain way, and they're important, and they're true, and they're valuable. They may teach us about the world, Maharal believed, but not about its creator. Now, historians and sociologists have documented beautifully how among Christians, the study of nature until the modern era was often spurred and encouraged by religious concerns. Christians often under sought to understand the book of God's words, the, the Bible, by turning their gazes onto the book of God's works, the universe. For these Christians, science had real religious value. This sort of motivation wasn't entirely absent among Jews, but it was rare, and usually it was weak. When Darwin published his theory of evolution, there were Jews who embraced it right out, and there were Jews who rejected it right out. But few, if any, saw it as a threat to piety in the way that many Christians, particularly fundamentalist Christians, did at the time. That's one recurring pattern. Um, another recurring pattern is this. Jews often associated natural knowledge with others and with their place among these others. From the earliest Jewish texts, the study of nature was understood as quote unquote external knowledge, chokhmah chitonit, that's how, that was the name for science for, uh, for generations, external knowledge. Although there were in different times Jews who argued otherwise, claiming th those Jews claiming for instance that science in fact traced its origins to King Solomon, mostly science was viewed as knowledge that had been created by Gentiles by Greeks first, then by Muslims and by Christians, and not by Jews. This identification of the origins of science with others sometimes produced in Jews a feeling of cultural inferiority, but more often it led them to somewhat lightly disparage the importance of science itself, which they often accepted, but accepted as the achievements of others. Given all this, it's not surprising that Jewish interest in science thrived when and where different cultures met, or when and where Jews met in a profound way with different cultures. It flourished, for instance, in the Judeo-Arabic milieu of medieval Islam, leading up to what's sometimes called the Golden Age of Spain. And it flared in other places of cultural exchange between Jews and Christians, like late medieval Provence, or the Prague of Emperor Rudolf II, where Maharal of Prague worked, or 17th century Padua, or 18th century Berlin. In all these places, Jews saw science as something of consequence, something that did matter, that could in fact be shared by Jews and, and the Muslims and the Christians among whom they lived. Because science is universal, they argued, and because it's about a world that we in fact all share, not a Jewish world, not a Christian world, not a Muslim world, but the world, these Jews saw science as something that could join Jews and others, as a bridge in times and places when such bridges were very hard to find indeed. Something like this was behind the conclusion of many Jews in the modern era that science has a big role to play in integrating Jews into the Western societies in which they found themselves. These Jews looked to science to advance the values of progress, of inclusion, and equality for which science seemed to stand. They looked to science to dislodge old cultural elites in, in the United States, dislodge old Protestant cultural elites, and to democratize the public square. 
At the same time, they looked to science to dispel the parochialism of Jews themselves as they made their world from isolated traditional communities from, say, the Pale of Settlement in Russia into the cultural centers of the West. In the 20th century, Jews turned to science in unprecedented, huge, heroic numbers, partly because they believed science could help Jews become part of American society, say, or German society, or French society, or British, or Russian, by helping to reform these societies to make them more fit for Jews, more progressive, more open, more objective, more data-based, and by helping them reform Jews to make them more fit for modern Western society. This is the science that my own father knew and loved and that he loves to this day. My father, whose own parents came here to New York from Russia after the First World War, found themselves greenhorns, kept at bay from the center of power and status in this city, earning their livings by pulling carts and selling whatever they could find to sell to whomever they could find to buy. My father, who went to City College and then to Columbia and NYU, liked so many of his generation to master a science, psychology in his case, that would allow him to move into American society in a way that his parents never could. And that would allow him to fight to reform American society. Reform in both senses, to reshape it and to improve it at the same time. To reform American society into a society that lived by the values of science itself, in which the worth of a person is not judged by where he came from, or the timber of his accent, or the nap of his hair, or the building he prays in or chooses never to pray in. To my father, like so many Jews of his generation, science was a tool, a way into a society in which Jews were still viewed with suspicion and often distaste. It was a tool and it was also an ideal of being meritocratic, objective, progressive, open, and inviting to all who had the talent and the will and the brains and the gumption to take part. So if one pattern finds in the anarchic pluralism of Jewish history, um, that Jews only rarely care deeply about how the ideas in science, the capital T theories, fit with Judaism itself. And if another pattern is that Jews in different circumstances saw science as inseparable from the relations or from the relations between Jews and others, Christians and Muslims among whom they live, a third pattern can be expressed with this tautology. Science mattered to Jews when science mattered to Jews. What I mean is, most often, when science mattered to Jews, it was not because of a grand abstraction, big bangs and the like. It was because it affected the way we Jews live our lives. I mean this, for a lot of Jews as I, in the 20th century, as I've said, science offered a way into Christian society and a way to make Christian society less exclusionarily Christian. Science did something to reshape society itself. For a lot of Jews living in the Yishuv and then in Israel, to this day where I live, Science matters because it offers a way to protect ourselves and to enrich ourselves and to participate in the world as respected, even revered partners, a dignity that's not often granted Israel. In these cases, and there are very, very, very many others, Jews engage with science with brilliant intensity and astonishing success, not because of what science says, the capital T theories, but because of what science does, how it helps to reshape the societies, the communities, and the individuals who, who embrace it. Science describes the world, but very often science also remakes the world. Jews have been most interested, involved, and engaged in science when we, saw, when we saw that it might remake our world in ways that matter. And I emphasize this pattern here at the conclusion of my remarks, both as kind of a blessing and as a charge. A blessing because you are here today, we are here today, you are here today, giving your time, your energy, your creativity, your brilliance to this project that's being launched here today because you see that we live in a moment when science matters to Jews, a moment when our world is being remade in front of our eyes. This was obvious from the remarkable proposals that you submitted that I saw. I admire deeply what you're, you're doing and I find it inspiring, hence the blessing. But this is also a charge because the way that science is remaking our world, are gro the ways in which science is remaking our world are growing before our eyes in number and in complexity. We all feel, for instance, that the scientific technologies um, are refashioning, that scientific technologies are refashioning our worlds with unnerving speed. Screens are making people of the book into people of the blog. Social networks draw my children's gaze from our flesh and blood community, our kavura, towards virtual communities populated by people who are neither fully friends nor strangers, neither brothers nor others. Psychoactive drugs change the way that we understand even our own personalities. Interventions through pill and needle and scalpel make sex and gender more fluid and willful. These things are often gifts and sometimes partly they're curses, but they always matter. Always and in all ways they affect what it means to live as a Jew today to raise 
a Jewish kid today to build a Jewish community today. So we need to talk about the, these things. We need to bring them to our communities, which is, of course, exactly why you are here. So it's as a Jew that I say that what you are doing is crucial and beautiful and moving. And it's as a historian that I say that what you are doing is very much in a Jewish tradition. Yishar Koch, and thank you. Thank you. So we're going to stop the video here for one moment and then restart it.